Shalom, Haverim, and Happy Father's Day, belatedly. Uh, I would encourage you to get your Bible, turn to Hebrews chapter 3, we'll start with verse 12, but before we do, join me with, uh, <laughs> join with me in prayer, please. God, our Father, we thank you for this time together, for the way that you have opened for us to fellowship together over your word, for us to learn from you, from our reading of your word, thanking you for the divine inspiration by which you moved uh, holy people of old to write, to share their hearts. Uh, we ask your continued guidance, your anointing upon us. Before we go any further, though, we would be quick to remember before you those with special needs. Uh, David's neighbor, Mike Kaiser, who needs a touch from above. Uh, Nancy Browning's friends, Dawn and Janie. Uh, we thank you for what you've done for them to this point, but we ask that you would continue to restore their health and to encourage and uplift them. Uh, an acquaintance of, of Pat's uh, through one of her neighbors, uh, Rob Barnes, who needs a touch from you for you to do for him that which the doctors cannot do, have not been able to do. We ask your continued hand of healing and strengthening upon Wanda Ingram. And we ask as well for, Bob, for uh, Wally and Barbara that you would help them, that you would strengthen Wally, and uh, that you would assure both him and Barbara of your presence and power in their situation. Thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Hebrews chapter 3, starting with verse 12. And I'm going to read through Hebrews 4, verse 11. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest? If not, to those who disobeyed. So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. 
Now, we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet, his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words, on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again, in the passage above, he says, They shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day calling it today. And this he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. That last word there may be a hint of what the problem is, disobedience. Returning to verse 12 of chapter 3, we read, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. The author of Hebrews is not interested in finding a few good men, as some people have called it, or a few, few good individuals. He wants everybody to enter in to that rest, to enter into the fullness of the promise that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart and notice this, this phrase here, a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. And right there we have this little capsule definition of what it is, what constitutes uh, having a sinful, unbelieving heart that individual that turns away from the living God. And I would encourage each of you today to turn to him. Regardless of your circumstance, regardless of whether you have been walking in light and attempting to walk in full obedience to him, or whether you have stu been stumbling your way through life, I encourage you to turn to him. Verse 13, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So he's calling upon the community that this is a community of faith. These are, uh, and obviously this is from the book of Hebrews, it is written to a group of uh, Hebrew believers, those who had uh, once followed Torah and, and now find themselves finding in the Hebrew scriptures things which are leading them into a new faith in Christ. And, and they have essentially been uh, excommunicated from 
uh, their religious life, their social life, their very likely from their, their financial uh, uh, base, their job situation, that, uh, and, and, and so to, to keep them from losing hope and to keep them from going back from uh, uh, where they are into a, an unfaith situation. He says, encourage one another daily as long it is called, as it is called today. Now, we do not have the kind of fellowship where we encounter one another daily. So how, how can we apply this? By reading the word. By praying. By lifting one another up in prayer. That we can encourage one another as long as it's called today. And uh, one of the encouragements that I would give you is that Today is today, but we don't have the promise necessarily of tomorrow. So make the most of today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And he is reminding us that that's what sin does, that it hardens. And it hardens through deceitfulness that that as sin deceives that we begin to believe the lie and the longer we believe the lie and that lie by the way is that God is not on the throne as long as we believe the lie that we are in danger of losing our faith, of drifting away from that which has clearly shown us the way of salvation. Verse 14, we have come to share in Christ if indeed, notice that's a big if, that, that we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. He is emphasizing the necessity of not just beginning on the pathway of faith, but of finishing the course, of continuing our trek to what John Bunyan called the celestial city, that, that place where our faith shall end in sight, a songwriter has said that, that we must hold our original conviction firmly to the end. And this is, you know, that, that there's something about a newfound faith that is, that is strong and is vital and, and it is absolutely set on reaching the final destination, not giving up. And, and he's saying that original conviction that there is but one way to find salvation and that's in and through Christ Jesus and to maintain that faith, that vitality of faith that keeps you drawing near that keeps you hungering for the word and uh, that creates in your heart that desire to do things that are pleasing in God's sight. Verse 15, as it has been said today, if you hear his voice, if. So God is speaking and there are some people who don't hear it. And uh, you don't have to go very far to run into somebody who dismisses God as being the figment of, of 
humanity's imagination, that we have made God in our image. And of course, that's not too surprising a conclusion for somebody to come through who has no faith because they do not understand that we were created in God's image. So why shouldn't we look like him? Why shouldn't our God look like us? It's not that we look like him. It's, so you may have heard a kid say sometimes, he says, yeah, my dad looks just like me. No, no, no. <laughs> it's the other way around, Junior. You look like him. So, verse 16. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt. Imagine that. This entire nation of Israel heard. And they saw. As they were first of all. Chased out of Egypt. And then once they got to. The edge of. The Red Sea. Found themselves pursued by a tyrant who had changed his mind. And God opens a way for them through the waters, and they find themselves on the other side. Egypt is behind them. The promised land is before them. And God is caring for them, providing them water, food, leadership, a legal system that, that they had heard and yet they rebelled. In what way did they rebel? Verse 16 makes it clear to us that they heard but chose to go a different way. Let's keep reading and we'll see that. Verse 17. With whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed. Remember that last word in the passage we've read? Disobedience. So, it is those who disobeyed. And reading on to verse 19, so we see that they were not able to enter. Why were they not able to enter? Because of their unbelief. So here we have an equation that disobedience equals unbelief. We cannot say we believe, but then add, but I choose to go my own way. I, w I want to do this my way. That failing to walk in the light as he is in the light is disobedience. And disobedience is equal to unbelief. Now, uh, I, I shared this visually in our live class, and you are certainly invited to join us for that on Sunday mornings. But when it said that they were all, not all, or were, were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? Who were they that heard and rebelled? And it says all of them. And of course, it's not easy to find somebody who will point out there were two who were obedient. There was Joshua and 
his partner uh, in faith, Caleb, two of the 12 spies that went into the promised land and came back with a report, a good report, a positive report saying, we can take the land, that there are giants in the land, but it's a wonderful land filled with fruit, filled with wonderful things, and God will give it to us. But the rest of the spies said, it's giants, we can't take them. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. And as a result, Israel turned back. So in effect, they were all rejected. Or all of them, I guess I should say, they are actually the ones who rejected the opportunity. They walked away from, from God's invitation. And if you read the scriptures, it says there were 603,550 fighting men it didn't include women and children. didn't include the men over age 60, I think it was. But 603,550, and there were two. For those who would say, it's not all two who were faithful. And if you do the math on that, 603,548 divided by 603,550, you get 0 0.9999969. That's 99.9999. Nine 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 and change percent. That's right up there. That is pretty close to all. And the point that God is making is you don't stand on very solid ground if you say, well, they might not have gone in, but I would have gone in. Uh, it's possible that you were a Joshua or a Caleb, but 99.9999, <laughs> probable that you too would have been part of the group that had said, we can't, and walked away from this great opportunity that came from following God's command. Therefore, now, moving on into chapter 4, that God had offered to Israel an opportunity for rest. And, of course, that's, that's illustrated early in the scriptures by the fact that on the, the first six days God created, and the seventh day he rested. That humanity had already been created. Their first day after their creation was a day of rest. God's making a statement. And when it came to rescuing his people from Egypt, that these people had been slaves. They had not been able to observe a Sabbath. And Pharaoh was denying them the opportunity to worship and that in general, but specifically, they were denied an opportunity to celebrate the Sabbath. And so one of the first things that God establishes with his people is the reality that on that seventh day of every week, they can look back and celebrate that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has set them free and that now 
they are free to follow him. This is their, their celebration. And that this is an implied promise that he is going to set them free from those things which weigh them down. Verse 1 of chapter 4, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, you see, that was offered to them. This is still offered to us that we can enter into his rest. But to do so, notice it says, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Right? That's a warning. You've got to live carefully. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. You see, it was declared to them, and they had an opportunity to either walk in the light or not. We have an opportunity to either walk in the light or not. That, so the good news was proclaimed to us just as it was to them. But the message they heard was of no value to them. Why? Because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Joshua and Caleb. That the 603,548 did not share the faith of those who obeyed. And their unfaith, and that is a in in the original language in the Greek of the, the this passage in Hebrews, you find the word that is literally translated unfaith. And unfaith produces disobedience. And God's response to that, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Now, that is looking back at the children of Israel. And what he's saying is, he's not saying that everybody who is disobedient is going to hell. He is talking specifically about Israel at this point and saying that everyone who did not walk in obedience will not enter the promised land. Moses didn't enter. Aaron, Miriam, they were in leadership positions. They never entered the promised land. There were only two of the original people of Israel, Joshua and Caleb. So, when he said, they shall never enter my rest, he was saying, because of their disobedience. Now, let's bring that forward. Because I just said something that somebody might say, oh, so he's saying you can live however you want to and still make heaven. You cannot. So, let's read on. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. On the seventh day, this is the end of verse 4, on the seventh day God rested from his works, and again in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. That, that those who do not enter his rest have failed to acknowledge that God has made a way where they, who are unqualified, can still find their way, can still find an open invitation how is that? Therefore, verse 8, 
since it still remains for some to enter that rest. And since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, why did those who did not go in not go in? Disobedience. That God again set a certain day, calling it today, and then he did, went, that this he did, when a long time later he spoke through David, saying, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. If you hear God speaking to you, saying, you know, you need to look into this, do not harden your heart. Do not be drawn away from that desire to investigate further what it means to enter into the rest of God. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. So Joshua crossing over into the promised land, it's a picture of finding rest, but it's not the rest. Crossing over Jordan, that's, that's not the rest. The rest is entering into the full provision that God has given us. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And that is for you and me, here and now. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his that you do not work your way into the kingdom of God. That does not mean that you don't work. It means that you don't enter on the basis of your work. You enter on the basis of the completed work of Jesus Christ. Verse 11, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their, Israel in the ancient days, their example of disobedience. Disobedience will get you nowhere. But walking by faith, listening for the voice of God, and when you hear it, obey it. That's the way. The old songwriter talked about trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Take him at his word and then do what he says to do. Our Father, our God, would you enable us each one to embrace this reality to walk in the light as Christ is in the light. If there's one listener to this who is in the darkness, would you, O oh Lord, show them the light and enable each one of us to seek that light and walk in it until that day when we see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen.